my privilege to introduce Dr. Michael Sorrell. Michael is the 34th president of Paul Quinn College in Texas. However, today we're welcome, welcoming him home to Chicago, where he grew up. He's a Chicago native. Under his leadership, Paul Quinn has gone from an institution on the verge of collapse to one that is now nationally renowned for its innovative approach to higher education. I was fortunate to serve with Michael on a panel earlier this year, and upon completion of the panel where we were talking about what needs to happen in higher ed to better serve students, I immediately turned to him and said, would you be our commencement speaker? <laughs> Among the college's accomplishments during President Sorrell's tenure tenure at the, are the following, transforming the football field into the we over me farm in order to battle food desert conditions of the community surrounding the campuses, becoming the first federally recognized urban work college, implementing a business casual dress code, winning the HBCU of the year, and rewriting all of the institution's fundraising, fundraising records. Michael received his JD and MA in public policy from Duke and his EDD from the University of Pennsylvania. While in law school, he was one of the founding members of the Journal of Gender Law and Policy and served as the vice president of the Duke Bar Association. He is the product of a small liberal arts college tradition, having graduated from Oberlin College with a BA in government. President Sorrell has won many awards throughout his career. Most recently, he was just named to Fortune Magazine's 2018 list of the world's 50 greatest leaders. Coming in at number 34, Sorrell joins the likes of philanthropists Bill and Melinda Gates, Apple CEO Tim Cook, and Oprah Winfrey in being recognized for groundbreaking approaches in today's challenges in their respective fields. However, the honor that he uh, has meant the most to him was being selected as the Father of the Year for the City of Dallas in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Sorrell. Good afternoon, National Lewis University. So I am the president of a historically black college. Historically black colleges come out, well thank you, thank you. But here's the thing, presidents of historically black colleges, historically black colleges, they come out of the black church tradition. The black church tradition is a call and response tradition. That means when I speak to you, I expect you to speak back to me. So let's try this one more time. So we're gonna to go to church for a moment. Can we go to church? Can we go to church, National Lewis University? So good evening, good afternoon, welcome to your commencement, National Lewis University. There we go, there we go. Now, there's a little something else we do in the black church, and we pass the offering plate. So I'm gonna be passing that around in a moment. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, one, because I have an enormous amount of respect and admiration for your president. She is doing an extraordinary job representing you, not just in the national, excuse me, not just in the local conversation, but in the national conversation. She is making sure people understand exactly who you are, who you are comprised of, and what it means to be a student at this university. I understand that for probably 99% of you, you have absolutely no idea who I am. You have no idea how far down they had to go to get me as your commencement speaker, <laughs> right? That's what you're wondering, and listen, I get it. I get it, all right? We are in Texas. We do battle for people like you, but in a different part of the country, right? I'm not on TV. You don't hear me on the radio that much. I completely understand that. So let me explain to you why I'm here. There really are three reasons why I'm here. Number one, <laughs> because I was asked, all right? No matter how much I would have wanted to, I couldn't just run in and crash your commencement and grab the speaker stage, right? Doesn't work that way. Number two, I am here because I was just like you. 
there were 19 years between when I got my law degree and when I came back to school to get my doctorate. When I went to get my law degree and my master's degree and my undergrad degree, I did that in a traditional fashion. I was fortunate enough to pick up three degrees in 10 years. But the 19 years between my law degree and my doctorate saw me get married, saw me have a family, and saw me have to work a full-time job while I got that degree. So I am here because I know what it's like to be stressed out trying to do too much with too little time. I understand what it's like to feel as if you aren't doing any of it well enough because you can't do all of it the way you want to do. I remember what it was like to have to tell my wife, we can't do date night because I've got to study. To tell my son, I can't come to your event at school because daddy has to go to class. And to fall asleep in meetings at work because I was tired because I stayed up all night writing papers. So I am here because I want you to know I hear you, I see you, I respect you, and I love you for the sacrifices you have made to be in this place right now. The third reason that I am here is really what I've come to talk to you about today. And the subject of what I'm going to talk to you about today, and let me be very, very clear, I'm not one of those commencement speakers that doesn't understand their role, okay? I am a necessary evil, okay? Everyone knows you have to have a commencement speaker. No one really knows why, okay? <laughs> because chances are, most of them, you have no idea. You'll never remember what they said, right? We're standing in the way between you getting your degree and you going to get your party on tonight, okay? <laughs> All right, right, right. No, I told you, I was you, right? I understand. Now, here's the thing. This is what I know about commencement speakers. We really have a simple job, and that is to adhere to the three Bs of speaking. Be brief, be funny, and be gone, right? <laughs> so I'm going to adhere to that. So we're going to get right to it. And let me tell you the third reason why I'm here and what I want to talk to you about today. There's an African parable that says, until the lion tells its story, the tale of the hunt will always favor the hunter. And I want to say that again. Until the lion tells its story, the tale of the hunt will always favor the hunter. National Lewis University, you have a problem. And the problem is, people like you, people like us, we don't tell our stories. We don't understand the power in our narrative. We have somehow been led to believe that our struggle is not a noble struggle, that the idea that we had to do it differently, that we had to take steps that what we've heard romanticizes what the traditional route is, that somehow that is a negative, that somehow that makes us less than. I am here to tell you it doesn't make you less than, it makes you more than. Your struggle is what defines you because you understand something that most people don't. Struggle is not a permanent state. Struggle is a transitional state. You start in one place, you struggle through, and then you succeed and excel. I am here to tell you, you need to tell that story. You need to tell, thank you. You need to tell the story of how you excel, because this is what we know in America today. The educational system does not look like what they have told you it looks like. The majority of students in our K through 12 school systems are on free and reduced lunches. That means that they come from families in under-resourced communities whose lives have been defined by scarcity. The majority of students in college today are on Pell Grants. In fact, how many of you use Pell Grants to get through your education? All right, give yourselves a hand. So if the majority of students in college are on Pell Grants, if the majority of students in K through 12 are on free and reduced lunch plans, then our country is a country where the educational system is defined by scarcity and poverty. So if that is the reality, then how about we tell that story? How about we tell the story of what it's like to get your homework done when you don't know if the lights are going to be on when you get home? Why don't we tell the story of what it's like to go to college and when somebody assigns a book that is really expensive, you don't know where that money's going to come from. 
How about we tell the story of what it's like to sit in class and not have the book, not because you didn't want to read it, but because you had to make rent? Why don't we tell our stories? Don't be ashamed of our stories. Why don't we tell the story of what it's like to be an immigrant in this country? Right? Why don't we talk about the pride that you feel to succeed in a land that is not your own? That doesn't make you less American. That doesn't make you less patriotic. That makes you American because this is a nation of immigrants. It was built by immigrants, even those who took Yes, it was. So if that is our story, if that is our reality, why are we not telling those stories? Are we not telling those stories because we don't own the outlets to tell the stories? Are we not telling the stories because we don't feel as if the stories have meaning? Or do we not tell the stories because we don't understand how special our stories are? If it's any one of those three, I am here to tell you today, National Lewis University, that ends now. Stand up, be proud, be bold, tell your story. When I took over the presidency at Paul Quinn College in 2007, we had less than 30 days of cash, and we were told that we were going to go out of business in 18 months. Okay, now, truth be told, they didn't tell me that when they offered me the job, right? <laughs> so, you might want to ask a couple extra questions when people offer you a job, okay? But our story was a story of woe. And that's all anybody wanted to talk about. You're not good enough. Why would anyone want to go to your school? Your school is janky. Right? I literally had a prospective student tell me, your school is janky. I asked her, can you spell janky? <laughs> right? <laughs> That, that's another conversation, right? But my point is, everyone wrote us off. So we started out with a simple goal. We said we're going to become one of America's great small colleges. But we're going to do it our way. We're going to tell a different story. We're going to write a different book. And we're going to be unapologetic and strident about it. Right? We will not hold our heads down, we will hold our heads up, and we will fight the fights that our students and our communities need fought. So we were in a food desert. No one wanted to help us. We even offered free land if people would open up a grocery store. One grocer told us the people in our neighborhood didn't look like their customers. Yeah, the people in our neighborhood, 98% of them look just like you. Right? That's cool. We have other ways of fighting back, so we cut the football program. I mean, we lost every game anyway, so there was no point keep playing, <laughs> all right? We cut the football program and turned the football field into a farm because we wanted to show people we're going to write a different story, right? We're going to write a story about how you succeed. We're going to write a story about how you take what others see as worthless and define it with a whole new value proposition. That is how you begin to tell your story. Then they told us that our students weren't good enough that because they didn't have the money they needed to go to school, that they didn't count as much. So we said, cool. We cut tuition and fees by $10,000 to make sure everyone could go to school. Right? Then we created a system where all our students got jobs in addition to going to school. And then we told that story. And all of a sudden, we went from a school that no one checked for to a school people couldn't stop talking about. And we didn't wait for people to tell our story. We didn't call up Time Magazine. We didn't call up any of the other news outlets and say, write our story. We started to write our own story. Because you know what? Social media allows you to do that, right? So we tweeted our story. We put it on Facebook. We Instagrammed our story. We Snapchatted our story. And along the way, all the traditional news sources started writing about our story. And then we got in front of people and we told our story our way. So the reason I'm sharing all this with you is because you need to tell this story. You need to be evangelists for your institution, for your communities, and for your lives. You need to stand up proudly and boldly and claim your story, claim your history, challenge other people to be dismissive. And when they are, tell them, shut up. No, I'm serious. The longer you allow foolishness to be spread about you, the longer foolishness will be spread about you. 
You have to meet those people who are not in your corner head on. Now, here's the thing. When you do that, you will find out you have friends. You will have friends in places you never knew, right? Because one thing America really loves, they love the underdog. They've always loved the underdog. But they love the underdog who tells their story. So as I take my seat, because I promise you I'd be good, I'd be brief, and I'd get the hell out of here, right? <laughs> I want you to understand this. When you tell your story, when you stand up and fight for yourself, when you let people in on the secret that is National Lewis University, and that is you, class of 2018, you will have friends that you did not know you had. You will have allies that you could not ever imagine. If you doubt that for one moment, dial down to Dallas, Texas. Call Paul Quinn College. Tell them you are getting up. You are fighting back. You are telling your story. And I promise you, we will come join you in telling your story. We will support you. We will help you. We will bring others with you. We will celebrate you. Because at the end of the day, more than anything else, what we want for you is a great life. We want a life that you dream of. We want a dream that is so big, so bold, that it scares you. But that's what dreaming is for. That's what your dreams can do. Stand up, tell your story, so that the tail of the hunt will favor not the hunter, but will favor the lion, and spend the rest of your lives being the lion. I wish you the best life humanly possible. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the honor of being your graduation speaker. And thank you for not booing me because you didn't know who I was. Thank you.